So we look forward to a very fruitful discussion with you and of course hearing your thoughts and views. Well, the ECB's climate agenda, agenda is very wide. Today we will focus on banking supervision. Since a few years, we have carried out a lot of activities at the supervisory front and see how banks are prepared to manage the risk. And today I'm, I'm very pleased that we can already present to you the results of the thematic review and the road ahead. But before moving to the presentations of the speakers we have in the room today, uh, let me first go through a few housekeeping rules with you just to be on the safe side and we run this seminar as smooth as possible. Uh, first of all, keep your microphones muted if you're not speaking. Secondly, if you can, if we move to the Q&A, uh, could you please put on your camera so we have a bit more of an interaction with you. Uh, and please also be aware that this seminar is being recorded and will be published on our website in the coming days. And finally, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please write to host in the chat box and, and a member of a team will uh, assist you right away to fix, try to fix the problems. But now let me turn your, our attention to the two colleagues here joining me on this panel. We have Frank Alderson, a member of the executive board of the ECB, vice chair of the supervisory board. And since 2020, he's also co-chairing the work of the task force on climate related financial risk of the Basel committee on banking supervision. And of course, before that, a lot of work on the NGFS side. Secondly, we have today with us Patrick Amis, who is the Director General of Specialized Institutions and LSIs, and his business area was in charge of run running this thematic review. And I will now hand over to Frank for some oh, welcoming remarks. Frank, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Irene. And um, um, a good uh, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, to all of you present, uh, present, uh, present here today. Let me start with two quotes. More bad news for the planet. Greenhouse gas levels hit new highs. And also the global energy crisis can be a historic turning point towards a cleaner and more secure future. Two headlines of last week, the former coming from the World Meteorological Organization and the latter from the International Energy Agency. Two headlines, two manifestations of the risks coming from the ongoing climate and environmental crises, physical and transition risks, two manifestations of twin crises. Two types of risks that are on the rise. It is the consensus now among central banks and supervisors globally, affirmed through the Central Bank and Supervisors Network for Greening the Financial System, that climate related and environmental risks are a source of financial risks and therefore are squarely within our mandate. Equally so, financial institutions recognize the materiality of these risks for their business. Now, there can no longer be any delay to turn this recognition into action. And this is what supervisors around the world expect from banks. Earlier this year, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the main global standard setter for prudential regulation of banks, published its principles for the effective management and supervision of climate-related financial risks. These principles confirm that supervisors from around the world now unanimously confirm not only that climate risks may be material, but also that both banks and supervisors need to contend with them urgently. This is what ECB banking supervision has been pursuing since 2020. Indeed, we have started to implement many of the principles that the Basel Committee has now established on a global scale. Over the last couple of years, we have launched several 
targeted actions in this direction. In 2020, we issued the ECB Guide on Climate-Related en Environmental Risks. And in 2021, we conducted a supervisory review of banks' approaches to managing these risks based on their own assessments. And at the start of this year, I announced that 2022 would be the year in which we would move to what I have called an immersive supervisory approach to climate-related and environmental risks. The year in which these risks become fully integrated in the day-to-day -day activities of our joint supervisory teams, which are in constant contact with the banks. The year as of which climate-related and environmental risks come to form an integral part of our ongoing dialogue with supervised entities and the supervisory review and evaluation process. An encompassing and integrated approach, which supervisors and banks are already very familiar with for traditional risk categories. An approach that will be here to stay. Today, we published the results of our thematic review along with the 2022 ECB supervisory stress test, of which the results were published already in July, on-site inspections and a targeted review on commercial real estate exposures. The thematic review forms part of the ECB banking supervision roadmap. The roadmap to ensure that banks adequately incorporate climate-related and environmental risks in their risk management. Now, what, what do we observe on where banks stand? Simply put, the glass is filling up slowly, but it is not even half full yet. Yes, the climate and environmental crises have made it to the top levels within banks and some first steps have indeed been taken, but there is a difference between talking about steps and beginning to act. And there's an even bigger difference in doing what is actually needed. Patrick Ami, a Director General in ECB Banking Supervision and leading our climate and environmental uh, work, will go into the details of these findings. And before wrapping up, um, um, while not the topic of today's seminar, let me remind you uh, before handing over the floor to Patrick, that our climate and environmental activities in ECB banking supervision are part of a even broader agenda of the ECB to consistently incorporate these considerations in all our tasks and responsibilities, including our monetary policy. Let me reiterate our commitment to continue to engage with you on our work towards all these activities. It is with your feedback your support, your push and your challenge and ideas that our work and the work of the institutions that we supervise can progress. Progress that is urgently needed in a world that is committed to the Paris Agreement, while also increasingly subject to the physical risks from the climate and environmental crises. We appreciate your input in a, in a seminar like this one and through other modalities. And I look forward to our exchange of views after the presentation. And with, with that, uh, I've already talked too long. Uh, Patrick, the floor is yours uh, for the presentation of the uh, results of today's uh, thematic review. Many thanks, uh, Frank. So let me, uh, let me open uh, uh, with a slide deck already and uh, a warm welcome from my side as well. Uh, to this event, I think your feedback is really important to us. So let's move to uh, the, the next slide already to uh, guide you a little bit more to the details and of the organization systematic review. And also we'll take a little bit of time to go quickly through uh, some of the uh, other findings we got from two other very important exercises we run this year, the stress test and an analysis of banks' disclosures. But let's start with the thematic review. So the objectives were threefold. Uh, uh, D 
deep diving into banks' ability to manage climate and environmental risks, uh, assess, second, how sound, effective, and comprehensive banks' practices are, and finally, of course, foster, foster banks' alignments uh, to our supervisory expectations as published at the end of 2020. Uh, we, uh, in doing so, we run uh, four core modules, uh, a maternity assessment module, a strategy, governance, risk management modules, uh, and also three uh, risk-specific modules, and not all banks were subject to all of these modules, depending on the specifics of their own business model, uh, which were on credit risk, market risk, and operational risk. Um, the sample shows you how unprecedented this uh, thematic review is. We had in total 186 banks, of which uh, 107 banks under direct supervision by the ECB, the so-called significant institutions, but also, very importantly, 79 uh, so-called less significant institutions that remain supervised by the national competent authorities in here. Let me point to the fact that this uh, review is very, very much a joint endeavor with our colleagues in the national competent authorities, and we are very grateful that they also contribute to the number of LSIs to this exercise. This is very important. We disseminate these exercises and, and sound practices across the system. Let me move to the next slide. Uh, just to give you immediately a summary of the thematic review uh, findings. So, uh, the overall development compared to our previous exercise in 2021 is positive. Uh, many banks have overall improved their capabilities, uh, but as uh, Frank uh, already put it, uh, the glass is not even half full. We still have a quite a number of banks that are lacking more sophisticated methodologies and granular information. Uh, it means that most banks have devised basic practices, uh, but half of them fail to uh, implement them effectively. Uh, so as a result, this means that uh, banks continue to significantly underestimate these risks. And uh, we have found that nearly all of them have blind spots. And you can see it very clearly in uh, the graph on the right uh, side of this slide. Let me uh, move to the next slide then, uh, with a few selected results per thematic review uh, module. Uh, with respect to the materiality assessment, this is really the very basic foundational starting point of all of this. Banks need to be convinced and assess properly that they are materially exposed to this risk. And importantly, uh, where we had only half of the banks that thought they were materially, materially exposed to climate risk in 2021, we now have 80% of the banks. And it means that the more banks start digging into the topic, the more they find out that it is material. And so we do expect that this materiality assessment uh, by banks will mean that uh, more and more banks find that they are materially exposed to climate related and other environmental risks. Uh, then the strategy module. Uh, I think it's a little bit of the same story in the three uh, next modules on strategy, governance and risk management. In a nutshell, uh, banks have taken the first basic steps but needs to further embed uh, climate and other uh, environmental risks into their actual practices, uh, frameworks for uh, risk appetite, governance, and risk management. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, only uh, a quarter of the banks that have uh, advanced quantification methods for risk management. And this is uh, far too low, and we need to continue seeing progress. Let me move to the next slide. Uh, also now to uh, broaden a little bit before I come back to the follow-up of the thematic review, to broaden a little bit on what we did this year as well. I think it is important to have a, a broader picture of what we do in banking supervision with respect to climate-related risks. Um, so uh, a reminder of the recent findings from the stress test uh, published in July this year. 
where we show that uh, uh, banks continue to rely quite uh, intensively on uh, carbon intensive sectors. Uh, we saw that despite uh, the uh, stresses exercise being focused on a lower number of banks and for a limited part of their exposures, uh, we already got 70 billion of aggregate losses under sh uh, a short uh, term exercise uh, uh, that was conducted as part of this overall stress test. And this means that despite, again, the fact that the uh, portfolios being stress tests were uh, rather uh, narrow uh, in the bank's exposures, we already have quite significant impact. Uh, and then uh, we found out that a uh, uh, majority uh, of the banks had not yet integrated climate-related risks into their stress testing frameworks. Uh, let's move to the next slide, um, uh, also to uh, say a word about uh, our gap analysis on disclosures. This is the second time we run this one and we published it in March 2022. We intend to run another one at the end of this year or beginning of next year. And here we uh, uh, saw that 45% of the bank's disclosures were assessed as insufficient both from a content and substantiation perspective. Uh, few banks were disclosing meaningful information on finance emissions, alignment metrics, or energy performance certificates, just to name a few examples. Uh, with respect to transparency, one third of the institutions did not yet transparently disclose that they are materially uh, exposed to climate uh, and environmental risks in line with their own internal materiality assessment. And uh, finally, uh, we uh, saw that uh, many banks were not substantiating enough their climate and environmental risks, figures, metrics, and targets that they chose to disclose. Uh, and that was raising for us concerns with respect to reputational and possibly litigation risks. And of course, we will continue working with the, uh, all these banks to make sure that their disclosures progress. And uh, before, of course, they are uh, the disclosures coming from the EBA and from uh, the uh, European regulation become mandatory. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, uh, together with the thematic review and when uh, running the thematic review, we already saw which is comforting, a number of good practices. Uh, interestingly, those good practices were observed across the board. So we could not allocate those good practices, so to speak, to uh, banks depending on their size, geography, or business model. And that is comforting because it means that swift progress is possible across the board. Uh, we give two examples here that we published 25 of these uh, so-called good practices in a separate report today, together with our report on the thematic review. We hope this will be read very extensively by banks and readers of financial statements, uh, because we believe there is a big avenue for progress in all of this. Uh, just to give a few examples, the first one is the fact that some banks have already implemented data-driven due diligence for their clients. Uh, uh, this is very important uh, to mention, and we hope this will uh, disseminate across uh, the entire banking industry. Uh, the second example we wanted to give here is the fact that uh, banks are already, some of them at least, are already using scenarios for target setting uh, used in their own transition planning tools to enhance their long-term resilience and their business models. Uh, that is very important as well. We believe that uh, working on transition planning is the next uh, goal for the banking industry, and we will continue working on this together with the banks. Let's move to uh, the next slide. Um, uh, coming back to the follow-up now of this thematic review. 
uh, we have set deadlines for banks to deal with uh, the findings we and the shortcoming we uh, evidence during this thematic review. Uh, banks have already received feedback letters from us with on average 55 shortcomings per bank. That's a lot. Uh, and therefore, we have decided to set institution specific deadlines for achieving full alignment with our expectations by the end of 2024. Of course, we will not wait for the end of 2024 to monitor progress, and we have a number of intermediate deadlines, uh, making sure that uh, all laggards do catch up uh, on time to be uh, more uh, sure that we will reach this uh, end of 2024 goal. And so by end of March 23, we will already uh, um, have uh, normally all banks being able to adequately categorize climate and environmental risks and conduct a full assessment of their impact on their activities. By the end of the, of the same year, uh, they should be able to adequately integrate the consideration of these risks into their governance strategy and risk management frameworks. And then we expect to have uh, adherence to our expectations in full by the end of 2024, uh, including with uh, the way banks calculate their own capital uh, needs and uh, in their stress testing frameworks. Let's move to the next uh, slide. Uh, so the findings uh, that we have communicated to uh, banks have already this year started feeding up into our uh, so-called survivory review and evaluation process. We have imposed already uh, binding qualitative requirements on 30 banks in this year's threat to ask them to address severe weaknesses. This means that these, these severe weaknesses are not being addressed on time, we will stand ready to make use of our full supervisory toolbox, including enforcement actions. This is very important. Um, the second topic is that for a number of banks already in 2022, uh, we had an impact on the so-called threat scores that in turn uh, have an impact on the determination of capital requirements for banks. So I will uh, stop here. Uh, I think we can now uh, move to uh, the Q&A sessions and I give the floor back to Irene. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Thanks so much, uh, Frank, for sketching the, the full picture and also pressing on the urgency we see to address climate uh, and environmental risk for the banking sector. And Patrick, I think you sketched really well how the, um, where we stand today and also the transition plan that we see from banks to move from from where they are today to com full compliance by the end of 2024. With that, I uh, want to uh, give the floor to you. And uh, if you would like to uh, pose a question, uh, please raise your electronic hand and then, then I'll give you a sign then I'll, to unmute yourself. Um, and then I'll guide the question to the dependents who is best, best suited uh, to answer it. So if there are already any hands up, um, I know that we just published the result this morning, so maybe you're still uh, uh, seeing what you uh, think of it, uh, but I see hands coming up. Uh, Adua Dalla Costa, uh, looking forward to your question. Hi, thanks a lot uh, for organizing this. My name is Adwa. I'm a policy officer at Positive Money Europe. I have a question uh, that follows up to the climate stress test of this summer, uh, which I think raises uh, important implications for energy efficiency. Um, in fact, the climate stress test has showed that credit risks are at least three times higher for real estate exposure with low energy performance. And that's because energy price crisis, like the one ex experiencing today, translate into sky high energy bills for people when the energy efficiency of a house is low. And this can affect people's finances and their capacity to pay their mortgages, uh, which in turn can affect banks' financial stability. And the number, in fact, is not that low. In fact, one in 10 households are living in mortgage areas already. So I have two questions concerning that. And the first one is whether you estimate that this credit risk have increased since you elaborated this data and since the intensifying of the energy crisis. And if you get us a sense of how significant, significant you think these credit risks are for the stability of the financial system. And my second question would be, 
Uh, from a supervisory perspective, do you agree that banks' mortgage portfolios would be better shielded if people had access to affordable credit to renovate their homes? Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for this question. And I think, uh, Patrick, can I give this question to you? So it's really on the, yeah. on the credit yeah. risks and the... Yeah, yeah ma many things. So um, uh, what we see undoubtedly is that the current energy crisis and the fact that uh, energy bills do increase uh, may have an impact on affordability uh, for uh, customers, uh, undoubtedly, and we see this across the board, of course, and so we do expect that we will be uh, uh, under a, a rise of uh, credit risk, indeed. Um, so that's, I, I think that's uh, pretty clear already. Um, for the second part of your question, it is uh, uh, still a little bit too early to uh, so-called put a price tag on this, it's, uh, we are, of course, working with the banks and with the banking industry in making uh, uh, use of our quantification tools, of course, but it's a little bit too early to uh, go to how much the impact and how big it will be. Uh, but we do expect, of course, that there will be an impact. Uh, and then with respect to the, 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 the second question you had, uh, but here, I think uh, Frank uh, also can uh, can complement. But uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, of course, it will be uh, up also to uh, uh, governments and uh, and uh, and civil society to see uh, how to help uh, people uh, moving uh, towards uh, better energy efficiency of their homes. Uh, what we know for sure is that uh, banks will have to play a role in financing as well, most likely. So uh, this is uh, also something we want to make sure uh, banks prepare for. And it starts with identifying uh, in their customer base who are the customers that might be in need of solutions. Frank, you want to add something to that? Uh... Well, well, thanks a lot, uh, Alwa. And since you were the first uh, to ask a question, uh, maybe it's fair that the, both of us uh, try to uh, contribute to answering it. Um, no, no, maybe on, on that last that, that last point, a, a couple of things. You know, th th it gives me the possibility to underline that whenever we talk about climate and environmental uh, risks, of course, as a supervisor, um, you know, we are not a policy maker in terms of climate policies and then environmental policies or social policies. So, so our job is to uh, you know to to of course very carefully follow. Uh, what governments who are elected officials, uh, unlike us, uh, make in terms of policies and then translate that into what does it mean for uh, the risk profile um, of uh, of the banks. That, that That is one part. And the other uh, part that I would like to say that in, in terms of, um, you know, um, people now being confronted with these high energy prices, which of course, uh, to a large extent are uh, due uh, to the uh, the terrible uh, war that Russia is waging on 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 the Ukraine, um, the likelihood, uh, in in my assessment, the likelihood of the energy transition taking place, although at the very uh, you know short end of the um, of the timeline, maybe um, uh, we will be um, uh, you know burning, uh, if you like, uh, more fossil fuels than 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 we would otherwise have done. Uh, in the in the in the somewhat longer term uh, and even medium term, uh, I think the likelihood of the transition taking place has increased increased uh, because people now understand that also in terms of our energy of uh, independence, uh, we need to make this transition. Um, and that being the case, also the transition risks uh, for the financial sector at large and for banks specifically um, uh, have increased as well. Uh, and that, of course, then gives us an, a, you know, a, 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 a reinforced angle, if you like, uh, to challenge whether they are actually up to the job uh, in managing these risks. Thanks so much, uh, Frank, uh, for this answer as well. I think this is a very important signal as well to give that the whole energy crisis and the green transition should really go hand in hand and point in the same direction. And this is... Uh, also based on the work uh, the ECB has done, we shouldn't put uh, climate at the back stove because we have an energy crisis to fix now. We really should aim to have to tackle both and accelerate, use the momentum to accelerate uh, the green transition. 
So that's, uh, that's our point there. Then I would like to move to the second question from Maud from the WWF. Good to see you again, Maud. Hello, good to see you again to Irene and thank you very much for, for this presentation. Uh, well, I have a question regarding the deadline that are applicable to, to banks in Europe now and the binding uh, requirements we have made uh, for some of them. So first of all, will the deadline be, be applicable uh, in the same uh, way to a significant institution and less significant institution? Second question is more um, on, uh, well, can you give a, an example of binding qualitative and quantitative requirements you have made to some banks uh, without giving any name, obviously, but it would be good to understand what could be a qualitative or quantitative requirement regarding climate related risk, but also regarding other environmental related risks. And the last one is more on uh, the scope of application of those requirements and, and, um, and the deadline. Uh, will this be applicable globally to, to banks and to uh, at a consolidated level or only for activities in, in Europe? Thank you very much. Thank, thanks so much, Maud, for these excellent questions. Uh, Patrick, I think I can give you the floor yeah. on this one. Many thanks, Irene, and uh, yeah, good to see you again, uh, Maud. Um, so uh, on, on, the, on the, the, the questions, I'm trying to remember all of them. Please uh, uh, repeat them if I'm not answering. Um, so on the uh, examples of uh, qualitative and quantitative requirements, so on quantitative requirements, uh, we have not yet moved to uh, quantitative pillar two capital requirements. Uh, we have done it uh, for a handful of banks. Uh, indirectly via the change in threat scores. Uh, eventually, we will move to uh, capital requirements in pillar two. Uh, so we are at qualitative requirements for the time being. Uh, to give you an example of qualitative requirements, um, we have banks that did not conduct a proper uh, uh, assessment of the materiality of these risks. And so they were asked to provide us with uh, a, a proper uh, materiality assessment by a certain deadline. And so we have a number of parameters to, to uh, verify that this is a proper assessment. So uh, uh, meaning that they, we expect that they go through the, the full portfolio of their exposures, that they look at uh, both physical and transition risks and so on and so forth. And that they sort of get an understanding of how and, and when it could start uh, impacting their own portfolios. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, and we had, uh, uh, of course, uh, this could be applicable for climate related risks, but also for other environmental risks. And I take the opportunity to mention that in uh, the thematic review, we also included in our report a small chapter on uh, other uh, uh, environmental related risks, because we believe that they are very important as well. And uh, we need uh, to focus not only on pure climate risk, but also on other environmental risks. And uh, we see that banks are even uh, 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 at the earlier stage than climate on this. And so they will need to continue progressing as well. Um, uh, what will, and another example, for instance, uh, banks that have not yet uh, allocated uh, responsibility for climate and other environmental risk topics to one of the members of their board. So this is one of our expectations, and we had, for instance, a few binding requirements asking banks to do so by a certain date, uh, to, to give uh, uh, two examples. Um, uh, what will happen if banks do not meet the, uh, the, the, the deadlines? And those deadlines are discussed with each and every bank. So uh, we're not regulators, we are supervisors who so will discuss on the bank specifics. And so we expect that these deadlines are their deadlines. And if they don't meet them, then we will consider using the full array of our toolbox, including enforcement measures. Maybe the question on um, LSIs versus SIs. And SIs versus LSIs, many, many thanks, <laughs> Frank. I knew I was missing one. Uh, we have uh, uh, imposed those uh, requirements so far on the SIs, 
and we have uh, of course a dialogue and expectations that our colleagues uh, in the LSI supervision so the national competent authorities will also follow uh, so we will continue working together with them to make sure that the findings of the thematic review are being adequately followed up also for the LSIs uh, uh, you have seen that uh, uh, the number of, of LSIs in the sample were 79. It's, a, it's a, already a large sample, but of course the LSIs in the system are much, much more. Uh, we have uh, a north of uh, 2,200 LSIs uh, in Europe, so uh, it means that uh, NCAs, the National Cooperative Authorities, we need to continue implementing also these expectations in their own constituency, and we will very much continue working with them. Uh, then you had the last question on whether we would have those requirements on the consolidated or European-specific uh, part of the balance sheet, if I understood correctly your question. So the answer is very simple. It's on a consolidated basis. So uh, meaning the entirety of their exporters. Thank you very much. Okay, if there are questions uh, about, uh, then I see a hand of uh, Julia Simon from Finance Watch. Julia. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It's um, obviously very insightful and uh, very much we are looking forward to um, to follow your work on this and appreciate of course i have um two questions maybe one question one more like uh, ask for a comment uh, so one thing relating i think to the question of mod and the topic you've just um you've just addressed um i've just made an interesting observation because in the uh, report uh, that was published today, um, there is a statement that 70% of banks um, already consider the climate and environmental risks as material over the time horizon of three to five years, which is a normal financial planning time horizon. Um, whereas at the same time, just a handful of banks um, have started looking into um, how is the, how are those material risks um, supported by the capital in their ICAP process which to me is a like, kind of an obvious discrepancy. Normally in the ICAP, whatever is material has to have some kind of a capital charge. So I just um, like wonder what your, what your stance on this is and um, if you've uh, made any specific thoughts on that. Because on the same hand, and I go into um, my second question, um, the majority of banks, of course, have still a lot of um, difficulties of um, implementing those processes. There are too many unknowns with respect to measuring and having the necessary data, which I think um, is also a known fact and um, the common difficulty that the whole um, kind of um, society faces now with this. So with this, um, my question is like, if you plan any specific, more specific guidance or like elaboration of best practices, um, I know you've put some in the report, but also any additional ones um, in order to make sure that the banks can, um, yeah, enhance the quality of those processes and actually the implementation over those two years that you are planning now to work with them towards compliance. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. Very, very good questions uh, again. Uh, so, uh, Patrick, one on the like the materiality assessment and the ICAP, and the other on uh, on our, our guidance towards banks. Yeah. So, sure, sure. Yeah. So ma many things. Uh, very good questions, uh, Julia. So yes, well spotted. We have a discrepancy between banks finding a risk is material and and them translating this into their own. Uh, capital estimate. So we're not talk talking about pillar two, which is a supervisory process, but ICAPs. And so indeed, we do have a discrepancy and we do expect that this discrepancy should be, uh, uh, should be corrected uh, uh, by the end of 24. So we will continue working with them to make sure that they do incorporate material risks into their ICAP. Uh, uh, so in order to do so, uh, you mentioned yourself, we still have data gaps. We do not have only data gaps. We have also, in some cases, methodology gaps. Uh, and so for this, this is a joint journey. And so we do not have all the time already now the answer, but we will continue working with the banks uh, to make sure that uh, we all progress and they do progress uh, towards uh, the same journey. One important topic, um, it's not because banks lack data that they should look away. I mean, uh, in front of a risk, you don't look away. 
uh, once you know you have a risk, you need to find ways to handle it. And this is what we are requesting from banks. And the positive development we see is that more and more banks have started looking into solving themselves their data gaps. Uh, here, a number of initiatives can help, and we will certainly continue helping the banks uh, in solving and disseminating uh, data. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite some work being done, uh, notably in the context of the NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System. We do believe that uh, uh, improved disclosures, including from the corporate world, will help banks uh, solving part of this data gap. So we, we do count on more disclosures across the board for going forward. This is important to help addressing the data gap. What we cannot accept is a bank that would come to us and tell us, uh, look, as long as you don't give me the full data and full methodology, I'm not doing anything. Uh, these are risks they need to start being addressed now. Thanks so much. Uh, yes, Frank, please add. Uh... Well, and maybe to to just add briefly to to the last part, um, um, because I I'm 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 very um, uh, I think it's a very important uh, aspect. Of course, the whole the whole debate about data. Um, you asked um, about the good practices. You know what we see some banks do is that they um, you know they 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 understand that the world is not perfect. They don't shy away for the reason that uh, Patrick just mentioned. I mean, if there's a risk, there's a risk. And, you know, closing your eyes doesn't make things better. It makes things worse. Um, they identify um, in this imperfect world, admittedly, um, different uh, data sources, external data providers, data that they can uh, pr uh, procure directly from their clients. And what they do, they, they rank these um, um, uh, data sources in, in a priority. Uh, by coming to the conclusion that, of course, it's better to directly base oneself on data that you actually get from your specific clients than from data uh, providers uh, at large. Uh, although uh, that second source is much better than nothing at all. So there is, there is, there, there is increasingly what I would call a best practice how this can be done. This we have actually put, I think, in the uh, in the good practices report, and the good practices report will be, um, at least in my mind. Um, um, you know, something that we will build on. So um, uh, this document has now been published, but uh, of course, if in the, you know, in the period to come, the years to come, we see more uh, good practices, uh, it, 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 you know, it's it, an obvious um, uh, consideration for us would be uh, to disseminate those as well, because we, we want to do, you know, it's not that we, you know, that we, that we enjoy uh, being uh, a strict supervisor, which we are, uh, what we want to do, we want to achieve something. What we want to achieve is that banks manage these climate and environmental risks um, uh, in an adequate manner. And if need be, um, uh, we will enforce deadlines if they are not being made uh, on a bank by bank basis, as Patrick has said. But of course, if banks, by learning uh, from good practices, um, um, can um, can make steps, um, that of course, um, you know, is very much to be uh, to be welcomed. Um, so, um, so thanks for for discussion because it it, it gives me uh, occasion to uh, to once more underline also the important um, uh, um, helping supporting part uh, that is encapsulated, if you like, uh, in this good practices document. Thanks uh, both uh, Patrick and Frank for the answer. Thanks Julia for your great questions uh, on this. I think indeed the, the good practices guide is is really something and could really really already help. Um, how banks to progress and it's good to hear that uh, this will be uh, advanced going forward as well Sorry. and there's one more thing yeah, that's <laughs> that right. no, that because i think it's important uh, and i don't know whether we have already highlighted this in this session um when we look at the good practices it's not that we see this in just one type of bank in one type of jurisdiction we have seen good practices uh, big banks small banks different business models um, different um, um, uh, jurisdictions. So to me, it shows that what we are asking banks to do and what we will require banks to do um, um, is something that is doable uh, across the board. Thanks for the good addition there. Uh, to, it is doable. So I think that's a good uh, signal there to give. 
Then I want to move to the next question. And then we have Yuri from Positive Money. Please, yeah. uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, don't, I don't hear you so well yet. Uh, hello, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thanks. All right. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. It was uh, very insightful. And from my side, I guess I have a bit of a general uh, question. Um, so uh, the ECB's recommendation on, on dividend distribution expired in September 2021, and the ECB decided not to renew it. Uh, kind of, first of all, my, my question is given the, the very highly uncertain macroeconomic situation and fast changing policy environment, uh, why did the ECB uh, decide against prolonging the recommendation on dividends? And secondly, related to the, to the climate and environmental risk, uh, in your assessment, you mentioned that bl blind spots were detected in 96% of their bank in their identification of climate and environmental risks. And while there is a lot of talk of action, uh, there are actually um, uh, actual shifts in revenue sources remain rare. So given the overwhelming need to kind of recapitalize and, and act uh, against uh, climate uh, on climate environmental risks, uh, why is the case that uh, governance of banks and their dividend decisions remain not uh, tied to their climate performance? And uh, what can ECB as a supervisor do, do about it? And you mentioned before enforcement tools. What could be kind of concrete enforcement tools on this? Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri. Uh, I think there are a lot of questions. And the first one is on the dividend distribution. Uh, can I give the floor to Patrick uh, on this? Yeah, yes, Frank, Frank, on the other one. Well, so. to take the floor. Yeah, on dividend distribution, I think we uh, the the uh, SSM took uh, a rather unprecedented uh, initiative to uh, ask banks uh, not to distribute dividends across the board during the COVID uh, period. It was an unprecedented event, uh, as you know, where we were in lockdown, where uh, the, we knew the whole economy would be somehow frozen for some time. And so uh, we had also uh, quite a number of uh, initiatives being taken to uh, provide for the financing from uh, 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 public transfers to maintain the economy afloat, etc. And so it was all uh, in in face uh, of very immediate risks and and um, and uh, and the lockdown situation to make sure that banks across the board would conserve capital. Uh, that being said, uh, our role as uh, supervisors and not regulators, so we're not doing regulations. Uh, is to look at banks on a bank specific basis, so one by one. And so it means that uh, um, although uh, the dividend recommendation across the board was withdrawn, uh, we continue looking at the uh, uh, capital trajectory and business plans and profitability uh, prospects of all banks in looking at their distribution uh, plans and challenging their distribution plans. So this is what we will continue doing uh, across the board. And uh, uh, we do expect, of course, uh, over time, as uh, climate-related risk will continue materializing in the economy, that they will take more and more time and more and more impact uh, on uh, the profitability and business plans of the banks. And so this is what we will expect to see. Uh, with respect of, uh, of course, tying uh, dividend policies to transition planning or, or, uh, or uh, ideas of, uh, like this, I think this is more for the regulation to say uh, and not for us. So we will, uh, we will need to see uh, whether the regulation and how the regulation evolves. And, uh, and of course, we will, uh, we will follow up uh, if and when the regulation evolves and again, we do believe that having works working on transition plans and fully embedding the climate dimension and also environmental risk dimension into their capital planning on the medium term makes an awful lot of sense. And we expect that this will be uh, taking place across the board uh, in the coming years. Uh, with respect to your question on what does it mean enforcement actions, um, so we have, a, I'm sure, a, 
a place in our uh, a placeholder in our website where we explain what are enforcement actions. I think the first one that comes to mind is what we call periodic penalty payments. It means that uh, a bank that would not uh, implement one of our expectations uh, would be ultimately, uh, upon of course, decision from the supervisory board and uh, government council, uh, would be subject to periodic penalty payments until it does implement uh, the binding requirements that was communicated to it before. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Frank. Maybe very, very shortly adding uh, to this last last question. Of course, you know, the, the, the toolbox has a lot of things and we will do things in, in a proportional manner. So if a bank acts uh, just because, you know, we ask them uh, politely, that is, of course, the best. Um, then we can send operational letters. There are um, uh, the, the threat letters. Uh, there is uh, periodic penalty maintenance. So the, the entire toolbox is, is rather risk uh, rich. Um, uh, we will use them in a proportional manner. And also to just say that, um, you know, the deadlines that we have set, what we did last year when we asked the banks to self-assess against our, um, 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 our supervisory expectations, the guide that we uh, published uh, at the end of uh, 2020, um, we also asked all banks to make action plans. And if we, you know, looking at these action plans, we actually saw that banks, um, you know, um, are planning themselves to um to 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 comply by um you know more or less the deadlines that we have now uh, now set so 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 actually i would be disappointed uh if we needed to scale up uh in that um uh, in that enforcement ladder if you like uh, but we do have these tools and we will uh, use them if we need to and thanks so much uh, patrick and frank for your answers to your questions uh, we have six minutes left. Uh, we have three questions here. So uh, if we don't make it to the end to uh, to have everybody ask their questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get back to you. But let's give it a try. Uh, so I want to have that. Uh, please keep it short and uh, po to the point. And then I want to give the floor to uh, Roger Casali from New Europeans International. Thank you very much. Um, question to Frank and Patrick. As you supervise banks on their journey towards greater adequacy and transparency. Have you noticed any patterns emerging in terms of what is conditioning their behavior in being more compliant? Uh, what seems to be working best uh, in terms of helping them towards more uh, adequacy and transparency? And what could be the role of civil society, how can, if any, in helping with that, particularly in relation to transparency? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a behavioral question. Uh, Patrick, can I give the floor to you first? Um, yeah, uh, I think what is uh, it's it's a very it's, it's a very uh, almost philosophical question, but uh, uh, I think one thing that works, uh, uh, of course, is uh, um, uh, the bank's understanding that they have our full interest. Uh, and that we are ready to go uh, to the bottom of it. So that's, uh, of course, uh, a profound uh, helper uh, in having them moving. But uh, I think uh, if you, if we, one wants to have real progress at the end of the day, uh, what is extremely important that they get themselves convinced and that their, uh, their uh, uh, governance is convinced of the urgency and importance of the matter. And so uh, this is one of the reasons we, why we insisted so much on having banks uh, first conducting uh, good materiality assessments, because when they do so, they do realize. Uh, and second, uh, having uh, a responsibility for climate-related topics at board level, uh, very important as well. Uh, uh, maybe the third uh, point from the civil society, of course, uh, having the regular pressure from the civil society will continue being important because banks also react, of course, to civil society, react to their customer demands and uh, react to their investors, community, uh, and so on and so forth. And from that perspective, I think uh, having uh, uh, intrusive uh, reading 
of uh, banks' financial disclosures uh, and the so-called balance sheet disclosures and so on and so forth. Uh, what we we uh, we call uh, uh, in our uh, jargon uh, uh, the market pressure uh, uh, is uh, is extremely important to uh, to our mind as well. So. Uh, uh, and having banks that uh, know and see that uh, uh, the civil society, uh, customers, investors look at what they commit and whether they explain what they commit to and whether they uh, follow up on their own commitments uh, uh, are important uh, tools, of course. And I know the time is running, but I think it's such an important question that I want to add a little bit as well. I think the you know, on board level, people have started to get it in the sense that they now, you know, I don't think there is now bankers that say, you know, we, we have to be, um, you know, um, the, we have to have a Paris compatible balance sheet just because they think that, you know, civil society or their stakeholders at large or us want to hear that. I think most really want that. But now the question is, how do you put that into practice? It's easy to say my balance sheet will be net zero by 2050. But the challenge needs to be, um, what are you going to do tomorrow? And how are you going to measure this? And how are you going to be transparent about this? And how are you going to ramp up if you don't get to where you need to be on these intermediate milestones? So going from the more conceptual understanding, which I think more or less now is there, and, and it's, it's very important, because you know the, the 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 tone at the top, the understanding at the top, the conviction at the top is an absolutely necessary condition, but it's certainly not a sufficient condition. And now this needs to be translated into real intermediate action. And there, I think you know we will be relentlessly pushing. And I think you can as well. Thank thanks so much. Uh... Frank and Patrick, I'm afraid that this was the, the last questions we could uh, answer during this session. And I, I have to say, I very, very much enjoyed it. So Alexander and Lucas, if you please send the questions to us, we'll make sure that we get back to the to you on a, in another way, um, because uh, it's time to wrap up. And I would like to thank you all for joining us today and for making your valuable in interventions. As I close this seminar today, we would strongly encourage you to answer a couple of questions in the feedback survey, uh, which is now appearing on your WebEx screen, if that's uh, all going according to plan. It's completely anonymous, so, uh, but it's just to help us tremendously uh, when we think about how to improve our next edition of our seminar series or other things we can take into account. So while you fill in the survey now, I would like to take a moment to thank Frank and Patrick both for being here today with us and for providing some really, really insightful views on the work of the SSM and climate risks and the results of the thematic review. I think we can all agree that climate risk is a very per pertinent issue uh, to discuss uh, and it's very important for both the ECB and the civil society to, to ensure transparency regarding the ECB's actions as well as hearing from you your opinions and working together to weather this storm. Um, with that, I would like to very much thank you for your presence here today, for your great questions and your interactions, and I wish you all a very lovely afternoon and looking forward to seeing you all back into the, in the future in the next edition. Thank you so much. <laughs>